Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel True Crime and Trials where I discuss true crime and trials and today is day 11 of the Derek Chauvin trial and before the trial gets underway the defence put a motion forward to sequester the jury. This is in light of the um, events that were going on the night before with the riots and the fact that another black man had been shot by a police officer. Um, the judge denies this motion. He doesn't want to sequester the jury right now because he's afraid that it will scare them. Um, and he says the only time that he will sequester them is, is if any of their names get leaked, um, although they will be sequestered during deliberations. And as for Maurice Hall, they will deal with that today. So first up is a cardiologist. First time test testifying, and before I even get started, he kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Conflicts against prior witnesses, prior medical witnesses. Um, as you'll find out as I go through this, it's just bizarre. So he says, George Floyd died from a cardiopulmonary arrest caused by low oxygen levels induced by the prone restraint and posi positional asphyxia he was subjected to. He can say from a high degree of certainty that George Floyd did not die from a primary cardiac event and he did not die from a drug overdose. George Floyd did not have a diagnosis of heart disease while he was still alive. No cardiac problems in George Floyd's medical records, no abnormal heart rhythms and he had had an EKG and other heart tests. He says high blood pressure is not a heart problem. All indicators suggest that George Floyd had an exceptionally strong heart. Now this goes against previous witnesses saying his heart was under enormous pressure from the narrowing of the arteries and the high blood pressure. So I was kind of sat there thinking uh, he's saying something totally different to what the rest said. Um, he says George Floyd was restrained in a life-threatening manner. He saw no evidence that George Floyd had had a heart attack. There was no injury to the heart at all. He says there was no narrowing in the main artery of the heart. In his view, George Floyd's heart was mildly enlarged. Now we've heard in previous testimony, depends which scale you use. They all seem to be saying different things. Top and bottom of it, is is that it was enlarged whether it be exceptionally enlarged or mildly um going into george floyd's medical background he can see that he had built up a high tolerance to the drugs he had been taking um, and george floyd's death was absolutely preventable so the cross-examination this witness will not agree that someone with a 90 percent blockage of the heart would just die he just won't agree that George Floyd's heart was bad enough to even be that much of a contributor to his death. Now, previous testimony says that it was a contributor. That because of the stress and being held down in that position, his heart had to work a lot harder. Um, so that's basically the main points of that testimony. Did it work in the prosecution's favour? I don't think it did. Um, but he did well to say it was his first time testifying. So next is a spark of life witness, which is George's brother. Um, and, you know, they're asking him questions about what he was like when he was younger. And he said he would always make sure that his siblings had their clothes ready and they were on time to school. Um, he said George Floyd couldn't cook. He, he even says he couldn't boil water, but he always made sure they had a snack and he says George was a mummy's boy. Um, says the last time he saw George was in person was at their mum's funeral in 2018, but they had kept in contact. They just hadn't met face to face. So the next witness, I personally believe he's, he's the star witness of the whole trial. I definitely think the prosecution has saved the best to last. He was an exceptionally good witness. Um, and he's a law professor. Um, he studies the regulation of policing. Um, he was a police officer in Tallah Tallahassee before he went um, into studying. And he is an expert in use of force. Now, 
when you hear this you think oh not again but honestly it was it's the best testimony to date um, he says the size of a person is a risk factor but not a threat their size can't establish threat nor does someone who is on drugs it appears when officers are trying to get George Floyd into the car that there is no acts of aggression from George he just didn't want to get in the car something I not in these words that I've been saying all along he he wasn't fighting them he was resisting but he was resisting getting in that car um because the prosecution are going through the timeline and they got they're playing certain clips and asking this witness to talk about it so when it shows the clip of George Floyd on his knees um when he was handcuffed he did not need to be put in the prone position because he doesn't present as a threat you can even hear George Floyd the minute he's out of that car and on his knees say thank you so where's the conflict he'd calmed down up uh, way down now he was out of that car he wasn't acting out to the officers he wasn't calling them names he calmed down he says the prone position is a very useful position in policing for getting control of someone for the purposes of handcuffing them. He was already handcuffed behind his back. There was no opportunity for George Floyd to do anything. Like, you know, there were four officers. He was already handcuffed behind his back. What could he have poss possibly done? If he'd have tried running, there's four of them. They could have got him. Um, when one officer suggested rolling, there's one officer in the footage that suggests rolling George Floyd on his side. Derek Chauvin says, no, he's staying put. So this whole testimony is bringing the issue right back home to the jury because we've had a lot of testimony on George's health. So you kind of put the original issue to, to the back of your mind for a bit. So this witness... And showing the footage again kind of brings it all back and why this jury is there and why this man is on trial. Um, it's said again after a bystander says he's not responsive right now. It, it, he was unresponsive. He was no threat. What the hell? The officers knew George Floyd might have been intoxicated, so this should have been taken into consideration, as well as the fact he said he couldn't breathe over and over and over again. They knew he was struggling to breathe and did nothing. An officer says he's passing out. There's no noise from George Floyd. Still, nothing. I mean, what? What was going through Derek Chauvin's head? He he was told what was going on, yet he still moved. Is that intention? Is that intent? This witness says that George Floyd said he couldn't breathe at least 27 times. His pulse was checked twice. It was not found. And what did Derek Chauvin do? Nothing. He carried on, didn't move. So throughout the whole of the 9 minutes and 29 seconds, George Floyd posed no threat oh, excuse me, of escape or to the officers. He was no threat at all. So moving on to the bystanders, he said, he points out that when Officer Tao says to the crowd, this is why you don't do drugs, kids, uh is he not trying to antagonize the crowd you know if if they're trying to make out that the crowd was such a threat why say stuff like that I utter just oh he says the crowd posed no threat throughout the incident which they didn't no reasonable officer would have handled this situation the way they did the use of force used was deadly force and the knee across George Floyd's neck and the prone restraint were un reasonable excessive and contrary to generally ex accepted police practices he says the unreasonable force began when george floyd was initially put into the prone restraint position and when derek chauvin's knee was placed onto george floyd's neck so he's pointed out 
George was on his knees. He calmed down. He said thank you. It didn't need to go any further. So he's saying the minute he was put into that prone position, that was unreasonable force. It ended when Derek Chauvin lifted his knee and George Floyd was taken out of the prone position. That's when the um, paramedics arrived and it was already too late. So finally, he says it was unreasonable for George Floyd to have not been rendered aid. Yeah. So uh, the cross-examination. I mean, I've not even taken any notes from his cross because he's gone back to going over what happened before all this happened which is irrelevant do you know what i mean it, that's not that's not the issue um and again <laughs> trying to make the crowd out to be an angry mob um it, it has no bearing there were, do you know what i mean they just they they it just Today belonged to the prosecution, especially with this witness, to have the spark of life witness. The only letdown was the cardiologist, but I think ending with this witness was a brilliant way to end it. Um, the cross, Mr. Nelson just could not get round it. It just, this witness was brilliant. Um, so we're here, um, we're expected the defence to start to present their case today. And possibly it could end on Thursday, so the jury will get Friday off. They will have the weekend. Then closing statements, um, closing arguments on Monday, and they will be sequestered from them while they do their deliberations. So although it got off to a bit of a disappointing start with the cardiologist, um, the use of force expert was the best yet. Um, pointed out what everybody knew but coming from an expert i mean what can you say nelson didn't have a chance with that so i'll be back with more in day 12 so until then bye for now